talking about um, the idea of the avant garde uh, and what it means today. The book came out of work that I do on socially engaged art, social practice art. Um, and a uh, few books that I wrote previously, one of them being um, Brave New Avant Garde. And Brave New Avant Garde is a critique of community art, essentially, and the function of community, the concept of community in a neoliberal economic context, um, in the sense that there is a sort of uh, shift away from, let's say, a focus on society. So uh, great society type projects that would involve uh, state um, support for welfare and social services and um, bas basically what's known as the welfare state. So in the context of neoliberalism, uh, with the devolution of the welfare state, the move towards privatization, um, there is a sudden re a renewed interest in community, a lot of rhetoric, business um, rhetoric about community or uh, the sense that people have that things are not um, going so well and so looking to community as a source of some some kind of um, space that would be a, a space that would not conform to the demands and the expectations of uh, living in a capitalist world and so artists um, turn to communities as um, advocates of various issues, or also as ways of getting communities involved in art. And so uh, bringing audiences to art who are experiencing or making works that are outside the conventional gallery and museum spaces. Um, some of this community type art sort of went back to the museum <coughs> in the form of relational art. And so uh, <coughs> the emphasis on relational art was on sociality, essentially, uh, which was very kind of um, sort of uh, managed form of sociality. Dialogical aesthetics is a different issue. Um, relational art, how does it work? Um, well, it's <coughs> art that moves away from the notion of a static object, a contemplative object. So it has a series of avant-garde references and, and predecessors, sort of uh, including happenings and fluxes and that sort of thing. Um, and so Relational art had similar uh, problems as community art in the sense that it isn't um, addressing um, <coughs> the question of the critique of the uh, institutional function of art in a creative industries context. Um, so relational art uh, responds to the crises of neoliberalism with a kind of panacea, the idea of sociality and being together and hanging out. Um, some of it sometimes understood, uh, accentuated as kind of micro-political uh, micro practices. And so the institution is not uh, an institution to be critiqued, but an institution in which uh, we all uh, somehow are part of a kind of broad biopolitical process um, in relation to which there's no outside, there's no critique of capitalism, there's no outside of that bio-capitalist bio space. And so uh, what you can do within those constraints is something like what Hart and Negri refer to as multitude. Um, you have insurgent micro practices that are in some, in some cases um, created um, and shaped by the forces of neoliberal capitalism, whatever they happen to be. And so um, the argument is that there's a, an inherent potential for communization that comes from the possibilities that are created by automation, 
uh, possibilities that are created um, by new technologies, new social networking technologies, and what have you. Um, so, um, relational aesthetics as well as dialogical aesthetics um, take <clears throat> a similar um, approach in the sense that um, the idea is not to emphasize alienation, uh, which is a avant-garde uh, keyword, including negation. Um, so if you look at things from an avant-garde perspective, working with alienation and negation, uh, you may choose to not collaborate, for, for example, with audiences, and you may choose to um, be moved, a certain move, as in the case of Adrian Piper's uh, catalytic um, performances. Um, so the avant-garde is proposing a critique of sociality in a sense that um, relational art was, although for uh, the, the main theorist of relational aesthetics, uh, Bourdieu, uh, he couches his discussion in the history of the avant-garde. Um, he's abusing the term, <coughs> or at least in France, where he's very active, where mm -hmm. he's coming from. Right. Um, there's this, he, he sort of has a kind of um, random sort of genealogy of avant-garde references that you could see in his work. Uh, but the point, is, the point of it is that you, you move away from that kind of negation and contestatory uh, practice. Um, similarly, Grant Kester in his discussion of dialogical aesthetics um, offers a critique of avant-gardism and of based what he calls um, the postmodern Baroque, if I recall correctly. Um, so the postmodern Baroque would be any sort of estrangement strategy. And so all of postmodern theory, in some ways for him, is um, sort of the opposite of dialogical aesthetics, in the sense that the theorist, um, theorist constructs the audience as somehow uh, needing to be enlightened or needing to be informed about something uh, in terms of their alienation. Uh, so the dialogical aesthetics uh, doesn't presume anything on the part of the artist. Of, and so what they do is they enter a conversation uh, with someone and then develop ideas for projects that would respond to needs. Um, so it's... Well, to, can you illustrate? I mean, uh, just in a simple language. Mm -hmm. Like, it is in a way, if I may add, when I enter the Musée de Monet, Museum of Money, or small change in uh, Paris, uh, there's a huge, there's a huge uh, heap or, 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 or hill of chewing gum, chewing gums, and there's a guy uh, who's paid for, for his day to stand there and to offer everyone who enters, every spectator, chewing gum. In exchange for something, you may have like a because still a lot of people smoke in Europe, you could have like a roach, you know, somewhere in your pocket or something like that, or um, an old uh, subway ticket or something like that. So he's asking you, do you have anything to give to me so that I can give you a piece of chewing gum? So it's really up to you whether uh, you want to accept this sort of exchange or not. Uh, a lot of people uh, feel cheated uh, of their original experience of, of, it, of art, of an art object and so on, because they think it's too easy. It's like it's not really feasible. Like the dialogue should be perhaps deeper than that. Like do you want a chewing gum? You give me, you know, you give me a fountain pen or a pen, I give you a piece of chewing gum. And so this is like we are entering a certain dialogue that he would like us to enter. Yeah, and um the space of the space of aesthetic autonomy, if you, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. allows for all kinds of possibilities in that regard. Um, and so, moving you know, moving beyond art objects, moving into kind of relational, experiential situations, um, the space of autonomy is is fine. Uh, you can do all that stuff. Um, the question is uh, for for an avant garde that is, let's say, conceived of as anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> how would you understand, how would you define 
that kind of project in those terms, in, in terms of class struggle. Yes. Um, you could. A lot of people have trouble uh, being there. Yeah. yeah, you could. There are, there are ways that you could uh, emphasize autonomy as, as such as a critique of exchange relations. And so it's not a co something that has a, de a commercial purpose mm -hmm. and, or an immediately obvious meaning. Um, so it has a kind of ambiguity and ambivalence. Um, and there's, uh, there's been a kind of, um, I think on the part of activists, uh, there's been a kind of uh, um, sense that art needs to move beyond these kinds of uh, get-together kind of, uh, let's, let's have a beer party and call it art. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah I give um, you a beer, you give me a glass of water. Some kind of social exchange. Um, because those social exchanges exist within a world of exchange. And so you, you could think of them as microtopian in a sense, but you could also see that they are in some ways kind of, the argument would be from the point of view of um, a, a kind of institutional critique, they become sort of neo-avant-garde and they become recouped as culture industry. And so insofar as they're connected to institutions, um, on a larger scale, the question becomes one of labor. Uh, how are artists making a living? Uh, doing these kinds of things, are they making a living? Uh, which artists? Um, so we have an open... Encouraging the industry of chewing gum, you know, for instance. <coughs> right, and, and there's no um, strong political message coming across. If there's no strong political message, then usually institutions are much more comfortable with it. Um, we can come to the paradoxical situation where institutions also will uh, encourage and support political statements. Uh, Brian Holmes in his Liar's Poker, for example, discusses the problem of um, a politically charged gesture in aesthetics um, <coughs> that when presented in a gallery, <coughs> yeah, when presented in a gallery frame or gallery context, um, the person's basically lying about it because what's happening is the, the, the politics of it is being diffused. Um, and we can say that for not just politicized art, but we can say that for politics as well. Think, for example, of the way the Bernie Sanders campaign tried to do something, but within the conditions of uh, the two-party system, uh, it was co-opted and didn't go very far, and by the media and so on. Um, so then there's a shift away from this kind of relational um, dialogical aesthetics and towards activist art. Um, various kinds of activist pro uh, practices like uh, Yes Men, for example, or uh, Gulf Labor, who are presently uh, protesting the conditions of uh, labor for the building of new Guggenheim uh, museums on Sadiat Island, for example. Um, so those practices are directly politicized practices, often made by collectives with very uh, clear goals. Um, and uh, for example, uh, a book just came out called Strike Art, written by Yates McKee, which is a, a very interesting discussion of Occupy Wall Street and related uh, movements, social movements, and disc discussing Occupy Wall Street as art. Uh -huh. um, yeah. For various reasons. And, um, so, what often happens in that sense is you have a shift towards activist art, which is not concerned for the work to be legible as art. Its aesthetic elements may be, may be prominent, uh, but it doesn't matter that it's recouped in, in aesthetic terms. So to be reviewed by art magazines or to be shown in, as documentation and exhibitions is less important. What's more important is to have a political effect. Um, and so, my, my feeling about what was happening in, in, in those terms of activist art <laughs> is that it was leaving behind a lot of the um, history and a lot of the radicality that we would associate with the avant-garde um, in the sense that anything that's avant-garde is often associated with modernism, with estrangement, and uh, with the notion that there's a sort of sense of uh, a group 
of artists who would somehow become models for another group of artists, which is the, the, what happened when um, modern art in the early 20th century began to model itself on Leninism and the Bolshevik party. It took, a, it took a, 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 the notion of um, key group leading uh, change. And so we have all of these isms developing in the 20th century in that way. Um, and so essentially in activist art, you often have uh, a very um, great reduction of interest in aesthetic theory. So the aesthetic framing and the aesthetic development of the practices are not necessarily important uh, to the artist. And so um, I wanted to, in some ways, intervene in that discussion by bringing back the question of avant-gardism. And so then the question would be, well, why do that if postmodernism has somehow consigned uh, avant-gardism <coughs> to the modernist past? Well, why, why bring it up? And so I'm <coughs> interested in the, the, fa there's the fact that symptomatically contemporary artists, especially politicized, engaged artists, tend to um, dismiss the idea of the avant-garde. And so if you ask someone about it, they'll quickly uh, shrug it off, uh, either as, either as uh, certainly in terms of themselves, as being defined as an avant-garde. Um, so this book has 50 contributors, um, and I'm working on volume two, which has another 50 contributors. And yes. so it's So in other words, if I may say, uh, Mark James uh, Leger started um, interrogating, questioning original artists, right? Original artists, such as people such as uh, Judith Molina of the Living Theatre, or uh, Bob Wilson, Robert Wilson, or not only theatre directors, but I mean different sort of visual artists, different sorts of uh, musicians, composers of uh, of um, well, of visual artists, you know. Uh, yeah, all art fields. Liter uh, literary li literature. Artists simply said, simply said um, the writers of any sort of literature. So uh, he was. I, I guess you were trying to 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 bring a, to bring about this quest. What is really what is the avant-garde today? Right? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. How, this, despite I mean, in spite of and despite of everything. What do these people do, these artists? How do they advance? How do they develop their ideas in the world such as it is? Yeah. Um, and um, so I encountered all kinds of reactions and responses from people. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to get someone to uh, collaborate on a project where they would somehow have to start thinking of what they do as avant-garde, even though in some cases we might think of those people as avant-garde. Uh, they, may, they may not accept it. For example, you may know Condé and Beveridge, um, two Toronto uh, community artists who worked with unions. Um, yeah, where are they tonight? They, they should be here. Um, Condé and Beveridge were very reluctant to participate, even though their work is some of the most radically left work in uh, the Canadian art scene. Uh, but the concept of avant-garde is more sort of difficult for them to, to, to go along with. Um, and um, as, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, no. It is a very difficult term. Uh, I mean, it's a very difficult notion because it was conceived by Bakunin as a military term, avant-garde, in the beginning of, I mean, late 1800s in Russia. Uh, in, the, in, in the times of the Russian Revolution and so on. But um, uh, then the term moved from Bakunin's term, the avant-garde, to uh, the field of art. So that's, but it always remained like, like a heavy military concept, right? Yeah, um, I often get objections, uh, especially in that sense, in, in, in the idea that it has a military connotation. Uh, that's, off, that's often, uh, and then on a postmodern level, you can criticize avant-gardism as being universalist as well. And so you have a more sort of uh, postmodern 
critique of masculinism. And so militarism might also be critiqued as masculine. Uh, yeah, and also it's such a now widely uh, polarized term because it had a multi-layered function. Uh, there were all sorts of, if, if you remember, the historical avant-garde. Whenever you hear some ism, maybe surrealism uh, or, uh, I don't know, just name any ism, Dadaism, Zenitism, so on and so on. All these isms uh, stood for some form of, some branch of the avant-garde. So besides of, of studying this, the historical avant-garde, which is also uh, very interesting and important, especially for nowadays for the artists, important term, we have, we arrived to, to the post, 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 uh, post-modern avant-garde. Mm -hmm as of today. But it's important to study the historical avant-garde as a, it, now it seems tacky to say my father, but it's really tacky. But actually this great um, encyclopedia, encyclopedist uh, who was uh, my father, uh, he was invited by a contemporary artist called Christian Markle, Markle to uh, see his show maybe 20 years ago in New York. And at that point, um, Christian was not into his loops and tapes that he used ever since, you know, like a zillions of tapes, like in loops, you know, floating tapes of, of uh, music tapes, like floating into cassettes, tapes, whatever he was. But at that point, he was exhibiting the violence, the violence of the walls of the of New York White Cube. So my father went there and uh, uh, Christian knew that he was a long time ago some, you know, like director of some museum in, in uh, Eastern Europe and so on. So he asked him, so you see, Mr. Zivancic, do you know, do you like this show? And my dad was very pertinent and much to my chagrin, to my regret, because I didn't want my father to criticize my friend. But my father said, you see, young man, if you want to create something new, like to be avant-garde, first you have to study ancient avant-gardes to see if this piece was already done. But it was. Dishan did it like 40 or 50 years ago. And Christian Markley was flabbergasted because he was not a good student of, of history of the avant-gardes. So he didn't even understand. He didn't understand that someone else had done it before before he did it. You see what I mean? So mm -hmm. so he was extremely disappointed, but anyways. Yeah, that is a um, certain notion of the avant-garde as leading progress. So being at the forefront and being original. Well, it, it, should, it should always mean like a step forward. It shouldn't be like a step right. backwards. Right. Um, the way I use the term avant-garde, I use it in this kind of Saint-Simonian socialist utopian tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so I use it to mean anti-capitalism, mm -hmm. um, essentially. So that's why I'm interested in the relationship of avant-garde to um, activist art, since activist art is articulated as leftist. OK, and but it goes without saying, don't you think so? so that the, the, the way it's moving. The, the activists kind of are uninterested in that kind of yeah. Well, it, it, the art is activist nowadays because it, it goes without saying otherwise. Because I think all the artists have passed, they, they went beyond the stage of decorating someone's wall or being purely de decorative and, and like a wallpaper type of artwork. That's everybody's, like, they, they, they're gone. They, they, they conceive all the artists of nowadays, avant garde or whatever. Nowadays, contemporary moment, they, they are re truly activist. Activists, because activism is something that pertains to them. It's, it mm -hmm. pertains to their moment, to their work. Okay, so uh, what we're doing is what happens all the time uh, when the, the term gets raised, mm -hmm. which is there's such a history, there's so many possibilities, that at some point um, you have to kind of choose something in this genealogy yeah. and create. Uh, create some sort of, or well, at least as a theorist, that, that's what interests me, mm -hmm. is, is to create a model or a theory of the avant-garde okay. 
um, that would build on those pre-existing theories. Um, so, um, in relation to Peter Borker, uh, it's an influential theory that distinguishes Bohemian um, from uh, Bohemian avant-garde of the 19th century, which were essentially uh, artists who were art for art's sake, uh, who were against craft materialism, uh -huh. against commercialism, and against uh, conventional bourgeois morals. Um, sure. I mean, be before so, Peter Burger, it uh -huh. was uh, Renato Poggioli yeah. who had seven stages of the avant-garde. It was widely translated into our language, Serbian, for mm -hmm. some creation, I believe. Yeah, uh, Poggioli's book is excellent. Um, one of the problems with Poggioli is he sort of he sort of couched and framed his work uh, after the Second World War. He moved to the United States and was very much affected by the war and by uh, totalitarianism. And so he kind of he, he sort was of, like Adorno, wasn't he? He's kind of like Adorno, but he sort of he shifted it from you know, from the, the fascist Italy. Yeah, he in had that to sense. Move, uh, yeah. Like, um, like, you know, but he framed, he framed it as a liberal theory, yeah. essentially. Okay. Uh, he, wanted, uh, he wanted sort of this kind of uh, liberal elites to control society uh, so that you wouldn't have any kind of dictatorial situation. And so his theory of avant-gardism tends to sort of emphasize that kind of modernism, you know, that sort of estrangement so that you wouldn't have stasis. Whereas uh, Berger's model is a Marxist model, very, very specifically. And so, he, he, he critiques the, or he, he, he analyzes how avant-gardism shifted away from bohemian anti-bourgeois art for art's sake towards the historical avant-gardes that tended to be um, more militant, and this was in the, the era of socialism and communism, and so they were often associated with communist parties or anarchist movements. Um, and in some cases, like the Soviet Union, they were actually supported by the state. And so uh, what they were critical of is what Berger calls the institution art. So the idea, the, the sense that art had become autonomous, and as autonomous, it had become an ideological support for bourgeois capitalist ideology. Um, and so the experience of the historical avant-garde, of course, uh, which made you snicker, um, caused uh, failures uh, and defeats. I of, don't of snicker, you know. I, whenever people discuss <clears throat> art, I I'm don't sorry. snicker. I, sometimes I cry. Like uh, 10, 15, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I tried to place an article, I tried to review uh, Basilit's show in Paris. And the editor of the paper in Serbia at that time, of Politica, they were, as you remember, some of you may know Basilit's work, it's always turned upside down with reason, with a certain reason. I mean, there's, I, I won't go into it because it's too complicated now to, <laughs> to get into this Heiner Miller Brechtian type of reason for Basilit's to do so. But uh, anyway, so when you see a man, it's always upside down, like, like a hanged man or something, like an upside down card in tarot or something like that. So the editor of the newspaper was always turning my artwork, like, you know, to stand on, on proper legs, not to be turned like Basilis wanted it upside down, but it's like he would turn the whole picture, image, and print it as if it were, as if Basilis didn't want it to be. So uh, what did I want to say? I think this is self-explanatory, what I was uh, trying to say. So this is like the real, um, the real story about, um, uh, about the, the state of art and, and the artist uh, trying to, um, to uh, in Germany at least, to justify their existence. Yeah. Peter Burger was standing behind uh, all these artists, like, Basilitz, who, who else was there? Uh, perhaps uh, Ansel Kiefer, who was the third one? Okay, never mind. I'm, I'm sorry if I interrupted. No, it's okay. Um, so, what interested me, or what interests me in um, 
Berger's uh, distinction between bohemian, historical, and neo-avant-garde uh, was that in some ways it had this similarity to what Annie Badiou described in his book, uh, The Communist Hypothesis, um, in terms of the communist hypothesis being something that was inaugurated as an event with the French Revolution. Uh, so you have a bourgeois revolution, yet framed within this notion of communism, which would be a uh, universalizing or, or generic um, truth. And so if you're familiar with Badiou's uh, work, um, he talks about the communist hypothesis in terms of intervals that are very similar to Peter Berger's um, uh, theory of the avant-garde. I have a question. Yeah. Is he translating into English? Who? Badiou? Badiou. Uh, yeah. 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 Very much so, especially since the 2000s. Uh, not so well known before then in, in English. Um, so, um, even though Badiou himself has this notion of uh, art as truth procedure, uh, which is actually a critique or a rejection of um, the idea of the avant-garde as a historical materialist concept. Um, so his notion of art as a truth procedure wouldn't follow Berger's um, analysis, but my, my twist on Badiou is we can take his communist hypothesis and relate that to the avant-garde hypothesis, which would ask the question, does the idea of the avant-garde, how does it function as an idea? And in that sense, um, uh, it would relate to Badiou's notion of uh, sort of capitalist, capitalist materialism as being atonal, capitalist materialism as sort of allowing all kinds of possibilities because capitalism is always concerned with uh, areas to invest in and surplus to uh, uh, generate. Um, so Badiou calls this kind of atonality. And so what you need in an atonal world is you need, you need a master signifier. You need something around which sense can be created and a world a world created. Yeah, it, it's really like in this lullaby, the Lutus big lullaby. Mm -hmm. Everything is turning, as you can see on, on the scores, mm -hmm. it's turning around uh, this magic uh, chord D where, where everything is starting and finishing, sort of. I hope it wasn't boring, but it's really when it's loving, it's supposed to love you to sleep. So this, this kind of art that you're describing uh, in relation to something like the avant-garde hypothesis or the idea of the avant-garde, if it's to function as a master signifier, as a, as a, a radical emancipatory yeah. concept, then things that are, things that are um, let's say, um, ambiguous or um, aesthetically defined might find some sort of resonance in those terms. And that would be that would be Badiou's critique of um, critique of I don't know what exactly um, something that's that's more sort of commercially oriented. Mm -hmm. well, Though he loves uh, popular cinema. The, the the problem with with the with, with the art in general and with the avant garde is that uh, it's something that once I interviewed William Burroughs and. Um, he told me, as I said, but you see, this is what he was explaining some theory like how it could be put to use in contemporary world. And I said, uh, but as people use it, they, they may also abuse it, like in internet, or I don't know what, anything. And uh, he said, well, you know what? Whatever people use, they always abuse after. After a while, they abuse it. So, like, in a way, yeah. Yeah, and that's a very sort of uh, postmodern kind of um, approach to things where you don't want some. You, po the postmodern is always, in some ways, um, presuming that you have a normative category that needs to be deconstructed. And so, critical practice means this constant denaturalization, constant deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Badiou is saying, uh, we've, we've had enough of difference. What we, need, what we need now is we need more sameness. We need, to, we need to have norms that would be kinds of norms that would allow a social project okay. to resist neoliberalism. 
because we have to accept that neoliberalism as a global model is is destroying the possibility of life on Earth, and so that's not something that you can ignore. And so I don't know, I don't know where you're going to get the the, the kind of um, ideological. Uh, programmatic concepts that are going to allow you to, to make things change, allow, make, make things happen. Um, and so that, you know, the question of aesthetics in we, relation we, we to politics. We have to keep hope. I think we have to keep hope as things are advancing. I think that the people, young, young people are getting, they're organizing themselves to whatever direction it may be to, um, to take care of some things that are um, crucial in this point. Uh -huh. And again, that's that's why I'm working on the avant-garde in this sense, in this uh, idea of communism because sense. Because you believe in it, that there are people who can continue to I mean, carry the torch or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's youth. Uh, part, of, part of the reason and the way I'm working with this is to actually bring forward a critique, or that's why I like Bahiu in particular, uh, is to bring forward a critique of <coughs> Uh, radical democracy, <coughs> which emphasizes uh, that doesn't exist. I'm sorry, radical democracy. Radical democracy articulated by uh, Laclau and Wolf, ah. uh, which is based on the equivalence of, of identities of struggles based on race, class, gender, sexuality, what have you. Not by our friends, uh, Hillary Clinton and. Yeah, what you have in that case, yeah, what, what you have in that case is um, you have the extreme right, and then you have culture wars. Uh, in the liberal, let's say the liberal center, you have culture wars that are, that are on the one hand generated by the right, and so the liberal uh, response is always against this kind of, you know, the sort of proto-fascistic or, or regressive, um, and so you have, in the, uh, in, at the liberal center, you have policing of identities, and the policing of identities often, some sometimes articulated as a critique of the intolerant working classes, who are <coughs> being being lulled by the right. And so, what that does is that it prevents from being articulated a politics of the left. Mm -hmm. It sort of it tends to supplant in some ways the politics of the left. Um, so that's Zizek's argument. Some people will say, well, leftists actually are involved in all of these social movements and um, identity struggles. Uh, but there is the question we have to ask ourselves in terms of end of ideology, <coughs> end of ideology uh, theory, end of history theory, um, end of class struggle. There's no sense of a working class project as a, a privileged subject of history. Um, and so, what you have as a result, at least in uh, the West, North America, is you have a kind of post-politics that doesn't articulate itself in, those, in, in the sense of a working class, radical, revolutionary, emancipatory project. You have rather everything that rejects that uh, among, among progressives. And so um, that's one of the things that interests me about the avant-garde in that regard is um, if you look at it in terms of Lacan's four discourses, this is maybe um, <coughs> off topic. You have no idea. Um, <coughs> Lacan's four discourses emphasizes I have no that. No idea what's known or what was translated here, as you are mentioning all these French authors. Uh -huh. um, what you have today is an emphasis on the discourse of the university. Um, which means the production of knowledge, uh, knowledge industries, and the production of artworks in terms of creative industries and whatever counts as creative industries. Um, so that all cultural production and intellectual production is worked into a capitalist uh, framework. Uh, the alternative to that is the discourse of the hysteric. So the discourse of the hysteric would be all those multitudes, protests, movements that are resisting uh, neoliberal hegemony. Um, the, other, the other two discourses are the discourse of the master and the discourse of the analyst. And so uh, the avant-garde, as I understand it, functions as discourse of the analyst. 
in the sense that it's sort of uh, the, it, the analyst is asking whether or not this multitudes idea is actually effective. That's very good. That, that's, a, that's a great interpretation of the Alga. Yeah, that's, that's one possibility. Um, in, my, in my schema, the um, master um, would be, I would put you in the discourse of the master, um, where, you have, where you have an emphasis on art as such, uh -huh. as opposed to activist art that has a, a sort of anti-aesthetic uh, approach. So the discourse okay. of the master is, is more sort of um, interesting in relation to art in the sense that, um, well, art today is having a lot of difficulties for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being the internet, the fact that social media and new communications. Oh, I, I wouldn't really make it confrontational. Yeah, no, or no, but I'm, what I'm saying is. Like art versus art. No, but it's changing, it's changing very much. I mean, of course, we have more art than ever before, right? Yeah. We have biennales and we have uh, art fairs. Yeah, but this is all the question of market, so called market. Right. We can go back to Hillary right. and. Uh, People and animal markets. Yeah, billion, billion dollar markets, and that changes how all of that is experienced, and it changes the sense, right, of art, in the sense that we don't have a salon like in the 19th century, which, which would be, you know, a very important event that all of society would take interest in. Um, and so, you know, there might be ways to try to recreate that in some ways, but there's also, from the point of view of something like art criticism, a little bit of a distance, a little bit of, you know, there's not a, there's a there's a, a weak sense of um, where things are happening in terms of criticism and in terms of like some kind of lasting value. I myself consider that most of what's important in the art world has been this this shift towards activism. Towards, oh, of course. Towards, well, let me towards if, social I may, if I may add, support your thesis mm -hmm. is that uh, I was a contributor to New York Arts Magazine in New York for five or six years from Paris. And uh, my editor-in-chief, who was a very close friend of Joseph Boyce, he was his Abraham Lubelsky, uh, he actually, the, 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 the most interesting activist work he did was when I arrived in New York one afternoon, very, very tired from Europe, like from a long flight, and I was going to, to Valley, uh, to the United Nations that was against NATO tax bombing of Serbia at that point. And he, he was there with me, he wanted to help me to paint all these banners and to, to, to take all these banners with me to the United Nations uh, uh, 31st Street in New York, 32nd Street, I don't know where it was. And then, then he was really, it was like we worked on it the whole day and the whole night, and it was really like, like a, an action or a happening more, more serious or more important than Maria Abramovic and then her co-partners, co-actors and so on. So when we finished, I was about to collapse, and Abraham said, well, let's take it to the United Nations. You know, this is like I really try to, to not only to help you, as my correspondent, but to help real cause to, to do something related, some real activist work. So then that was like the moment I saw Abraham Lubelsky, a merchant, New York arts distributor, editor, owner, whatever, uh, and as a real person, as a real artist. That's all I wanted to share. Okay. Um. I, I actually I specialize in retelling these like snippets of, of, of very tiny conversations or, or monologues and then when you put everything together into mosaic maybe you, you figure out it makes some kind of a story. Um, so I'm sorry if I interrupted yeah, you, but that's it's okay. just along the line. No, that's good. Um, so that's sort of what I'm doing with avant-garde. Um, maybe we should have questions. Or would you like to give your manifesto or something? 
Um, no no questions. questions or any questions? Um, I um, I was talking to some surrealists, and um, their opinion is that surrealism is not avant-garde. Uh, Nina, can you do you understand what that means when they when the surrealist says that they are not an avant-garde? Um. You know what, if you, if, <laughs> okay, uh, I know something, if you ask any avant-garde movement, if you ask, for instance, Guy Debord, are you a situationist, he would say, no, this is not what I do. There's no such thing as situationism. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 exactly. If you ask a Dadaist, for instance, Tristan Tsar, are you a Dadaist, he would say, no. I mean, the point of, of Dada or whatever is like to say no to all isms. So I, I. They're good Marxists and Marxists. No, but I mean, Marxism that's not what he meant because, because he, surrealists have no problem thinking of themselves as surrealists and calling themselves surrealists. That's not the, that was not the point. The point I'm trying to understand is that they don't consider themselves to be the avant garde. It's a different. It's a different. Well, it, it offers, if I remember correctly, it offers like a political subversive dream yes. of things. And that's really like an element, major element of every avant-garde, subversive. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, you can think about um, political dream. surrealism being recouped by art history. And so art history being very concerned to define it and to, you know, sort of uh, canonize it as an avant-garde. Um, but just um, something I read recently, um, a book by David Coddington called uh, The Avant-Garde, A Short History. I just gave a critique of Coddington's book. It's a short history. It's the Oxford series. Um, it's a nicely written book, uh, but it's very, it's very odd in the sense that it's conceived as um, creative, uh, creative industries framework for revisiting the, the history of the 19th century and 20th century avant-gardes. And so he's looking for ways to describe how artists are networked. Uh, Peter Berger said the historical avant-gardes like surrealism were against the institution art, the idea of art becoming aestheticism. Um, what Connington does is he flips that around and he's, he dis describes the way that those artists were networked and became professionalized. So they represented an alternative form of professionalism vis-a-vis, -vis, say, more sort of conservative or bourgeois forms of professionalism. Um, anyhow, that's the book. In that book, he talks about how in the uh, late 1800s, you had the sort of use of the notion of vanguardism and avant-garde as the movements were emerging as, as avant-gardes, as understanding themselves in this sort of progressive radical sense. And um, by the time those networks became consolidated in the post-World War I period, they ceased using the term altogether. So this would be sort of a historical phenomenon, n not necessarily specific to surrealism. I'm not enough of an art historian to, to say, but anyhow, that's Covington's argument. Um, so you're, you know, you, you're saying you're saying that uh, surrealism is about now. Well, no, it's it's uh, it's the possibility of. Yeah, it's psychoanalytic. No, it's not necessarily psychoanalytic. It's, it's revolutionary in the sense that the change is happening as we speak. Yeah, uh, revolutionary also, I would emphasize the psychoanalytic yeah. because what it, what it they, uses... They, they emphasize it. I mean, the surrealists. I don't think you could do without it. And yeah. so you're, you're basically uh, working with a model that's in some ways talking about reality as being not exactly not something that's positivist or positivized. But if I may, if I may just add to my dear colleague's words, 
Um, I think if you if you really want to find this like analytic side of surrealism, it's more emphasized or shown in their films, in the surrealist films, more than in the other artwork. It's always been. With, I think so. <laughs> well, it's always it's been. It's always been political. It's true, but at this but point, who were the surrealists of the twenties or the thirties? So they were also very political, if you remember. But like Breton was really uh, wrote his first cop and manifestos like communist. It was like the Communist Party of France, Henri Breton. Mm -hmm. So they, they were always sort of highly political or left oriented, the surrealists. Of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there are uh, rightist avant garde movements as well, like vorticism and futurism. Yeah, oh. but, but, but the surrealists were completely against that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, you answered that. Um, Anyway, like tonight was also supposed to be the night, but uh, of uh, the promotion of our small book, right? Yeah. The, 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 the book of correspondence. Simak. Simak. Smok, yeah, Smok. Smok is a Serbian word for a perfect kiss. <laughs> and um, it could be like, and you know, touching any avant garde you like, it could be even give Gustav Klimt's kiss or whatever. Um, I'm just like enlarging the field, moving the boundaries. Um, if you'd like, there's just very few copies of that book that just recently came out by Panto Press, and that reflects some kind of correspondence which to some unexperienced uh, eye, a professional eye may seem like a uh, correspondence, like a cha-cha-cha correspondence between uh, Nina Z, myself, and Mark uh, James Leger. However, um, as I as I read this book, I mean the manuscript several times, I must say there are some serious discussions of the avant-garde and some other stuff in it too, right? It wasn't like just a private conversation, like oh it rains today in Paris or oh it doesn't rain here. Montreal, whatever, it never rains around here. Yeah, I think uh, on a meta level, maybe not necessarily in terms of uh, the things we discuss in the book, but maybe on a meta level, I think that makes sense. In the sense that... Um, well, it's, things should not be like, like we say in Serbia, the first ball, like you're catching the first ball. You though we didn't know that when it started, actually. That yeah. sort of developed and happened. Uh, however, it's very interesting if I may say my final words and then the rest is up to you. So, uh, Mark James Leger invited me to, uh, to contribute something to, to his second tome of the avant garde, the idea of the avant garde, as it's meant to be today. And uh, I wrote something about uh, the avant garde of. Uh, the avant-garde, yeah, the avant-garde movements of former of the former Yugoslavia, and just that very delicate moment when in Serbia, my home home country, uh, when uh, Milosevic was in power, and uh, Magnet Group uh, sent uh, uh, like a, a dead pig with the words "President" on the, written on the pig and sent it to Milosevic. And uh, so I interviewed Magnet, uh, the members of the Magnet group and the members of Land Art. It was a really very difficult job, by the way, because they didn't want to talk, talk about it. Although I had uh, 
all the best credentials that these people knew. I mean, the artists knew who I was, like an artist, their colleague artist, fellow artist living in exile in Paris for 30 years and so on. So, but anyways, uh, so it wasn't an easy job to interview all the members, even my nephew, who's the leader, was like the founder of Lead Art Group, avant-garde group, he said, Tata, I, I've had enough. I, I went down this path or up this mountain and I don't want to talk about anyone, what happened to Lead Art in Serbia, like uh, Nikola Jaffo and the Lead, Lead Art. And there was a third uh, also uh, group that I discussed, like, uh, uh, that was Istvan Valenti and Katrin Nadik, performance artists, and what happened to them, and then what happened to the group Absolute, and what happened to this one and to that one. All of them uh, risked like uh, several decades in prison uh, just by, by writing about uh, the president or whatever. So this was like a very particular time in, uh, in Serbia. I tried to to, uh, to put everything together, and I interviewed the most uh, the most uh, prevalent artists of that time. The artist was the curator Darka Dragosavljevic, uh, who had a Vermont gallery, who was the most radical anti, and, and also like Borka. Uh, Borka Božević, also like uh, uh, the, the, the Center for Anti Anti Contamination for Anti Decontamination. And um, so the, the, there were so many people I interviewed, and so there was like a, one coherent story after another. Anyway, so this is all entering the chapter of uh, Mark's book on Eastern European or Serbian or ex Yugoslav avant-garde. So, and then, um, as we started corresponding on that one, um, we started also corresponding in general, and the book Smog came after it. And I, I believe you wanted to, to say something, how you saw this book, which just came out, and uh, you, you wrote your crash fiction manifesto. Oh, yeah. Um, Nina had put a few things on her website, uh, her interpretation of what... That, yeah, that's my way of seeing it. Yeah, her, her way of seeing it. And so for this evening's presentation, I had um, planned to write the crush fiction manifesto. Um, so Nina's going to perform, and I'm going to read to you it's very short. Um, Don't say that. Nothing is short. <coughs> what, uh, in order to emphasize, in order to emphasize some of Mark uh, James's statements, I'm gonna use um, uh, John Tudor, uh, John Cage method of. Um, I'm gonna time myself. So whenever he reads a sentence of any importance, and all of them are important, I'm going to do something on my violin which is probably, like it's going to be like 1 minute and 10 seconds, or 1 minute and 20 seconds, and then 1 minute of silence. Crush Fiction Manifesto. Fiction cannot be written today. One minute.
This is not a flat bed. 30 seconds of silence. The Invisible Committee, the Board, or any other group by any other name does not want it. One minute. Adorno said it in so many words. Fifteen seconds. Bifo thinks it is still possible in the long run. Ten seconds. Writing in earnest comes up against the manipulation of symbols. One minute of silence. A cautious observer would consider that the worst lack conviction. Twenty seconds. They might be right. Five seconds. Five seconds. That's it. Oh, that's it. Okay, that's really good for talk. Well, thank you for coming out this evening.